This is genuinely a moment of truth because uh, I've just come into my publishers and I've been given this, which is the first ever copy of the Hemlock Cup, um, the book that I've written about Socrates that has taken me 10 years to research and write. So I almost can't bear <laughs> to look at it in you know, case there's a mistake in there now or some kind of printing error that we haven't noticed. But um, so far, so far, it's looking good. It's very lovely to see all the pictures in here. Um, uh, th there's a lot of detail in here um, of journeys that I made to go to research Socrates' life because I thought it was a terrible shame that he seemed such a remote figure to people, this, you know, rather kind of aloof philosopher who just thought grand thoughts. Um, and, of course, he was really a man of the world. I mean, he lived very full-bloodedly in 5th century Athens. He travelled right across the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and so to try to piece together the story of his life, I've made those journeys too. So I followed in his footsteps everywhere. Um, I've been to the battlegrounds that he fought upon. Um, I've gone to the back streets of Athens where he lay and drank and ate and joked with his friends. Um, I've gone down to the religious sanctuaries in the south of Greece where he was said to have gone and visited the great um, uh, festivals um, and to indulge his thoughts and where really he was thought to have started his ideas of, of trying to grapple with what it was to be human. So um, it's a very physical book. Somebody said to me that I was putting the physical back into the into the metaphysical. But I think you've got to do that really because he is such an important man. I mean in the West we think the way we do because Socrates thought the way he did. Um, in the East too he was immensely influential. I don't know if you can see I've just have to turned onto this page here. Um, this is an early 13th century miniature which shows Socrates speaking to two of his students. Um, he, was, he was incredibly important in the development of thought in Islam too. This is a chapter um, where I describe Socrates' birth, his entry into the world. As is often the way with great men from history, we know precise and intimate details of their death and very little about their birth. What we do know is that Socrates was born in the long shadow of the Acropolis, or to be more accurate, with the proud 230-foot high rock at eye level. He was the son of Sophroniscus and Phinerite, a man-child of the tribe of Antiochus and of the deemed district of Allopiki. Southeast of the city centre, Alapiki sits snug and high on the slopes of the foothills of Mount Himathos. The Acropolis, with its crusting of world-class buildings, is unavoidable today. Um, its profile, dominated by the Parthenon, has become an old friend. The Parthenon itself has come to represent, across the globe, a certain kind of civilization. Of course, Socrates' view would not have been ours. The classical Parthenon was not yet dreamed of. Socrates' Athens was innocent of the bold beauty yet to come. Instead, he would have woken each morning to the silhouette of war ruins, the archaic Parthenon temple a jagged gash, toppled and burnt by Persian battering rams, Persian torches, Persian swords. But already there were whisperings that a phoenix would somehow rise from the ashes. So he is an essential man for our times. He spoke freely in a city that was supposed to have vaunted the importance of freedom of speech. And yet, because he spoke freely, because he spoke his mind, he was poisoned with hemlock poison um, and died at the age of 70. So um, he's an extraordinary man. Um, and, I, and I just really hope that I've done him justice in this book. And maybe 